Unfortunately, he forgot his Bible. So when he asked one of the nurses if they had a Bible, she said yes, she brought him a uh, cellophane wrap, New Testament. Not just one, no, 13. Now this kind of excited Dave because uh, he knew that he'd be there for a while and he possibly could help these new testaments. It was extremely useful. One patient he was talking to worked at uh, one of the big high-tech companies there in Austin. Her father was a Jew and her mother was a Muslim. And she there at the clinic because she didn't know what she believed. Had a conflict there in face. Well, he was able to share with her the gospel. And following, she gave her life to Christ and accepted one of the testaments. Now, David spent some more time talking with her and finally got her to let, her, let him call his church and have a follow up visit for her. So now you can see it's back. Another person was, another patient he ran into was a deaf patient that was pursuing an engineering degree at the Gallaudet University there in Austin. Now he was in the meeting room talking, communicating with his uh, sign that, sign that student, and um, they would approach him and ask him to speak to him. And he was able to share the gospel through the sign that, signer to this young man. And he became, he learned, he accepted the gospel and he accepted Jesus as his Savior. He also took the new testaments. Now, the, when David was discharged, he gave out all 13 New Testaments and he was able to witness 11 lives that gave the person the last he was very excited about that. And if you go back to his camp, this camp uh, scripture chairman shared with him that they gave 100, 100 testaments out, hospital testaments out, to that facility just a week or so earlier. So God used his situation and his, ability, his availability to further his work in that situation. And that's what's had to happen in the year 2000. The kids were able to come to the churches. We were able to go to schools and hand out things or other places to hand out things. So the Lord had to be direct us to use our talents and other ways. Izzy Diaz is so grateful for the healing ministry. Now, why she was grateful in junior high, she was given a New Testament by the kids. Now, being a kid, some of the kids accept them, some took them and them away, and others made crude comments for the kids. Now, she found herself joining some of those activities with the other students, but she kept a hold of the New Testament. She kept a hold of the New Testament. And she was kind of surprised how the students were acting and, and putting down the Christian faith. But the Gideons stood there, lovingly handed out the New Testaments, and not make any comments in the way. In fact, they did not overwhelm them with any kind of conversation. They just loved to hand out the New Testaments. That kind of question. Izzy grew up as a Catholic, and her parents said not to associate with the Christians. However, she kept her. She felt it was a magic book. And she also kind of liked the color. In fact, she kind of wanted one of the different types, more colors. But when she opened the scripture to the front of the pages of the New Testament, she found self helps. They fight anger, loneliness, sadness, obeying your parents, purpose, fear. And so forth. So she enjoyed looking up and finding those scriptures and reading about how those Bible can help you in those situations. 
She got saved later because God kept putting people in her life to help direct her through the Holy Spirit. The scriptures she received from the beginning of this will always be as we remember for her. The faithfulness of the Gideons lovingly handed out copies of God's word. She she felt this as God Himself spoke through those men to her. And she hopes that when she gets to heaven, she needs to meet those men who hand her a gift of testimony. Bert Jordan was a pastor. And early in his career, the pastor, he would work closely with the Gideons, asking them to come that he would have to the church and speak on behalf of those going on the world. And he really believed in Gideon's work for a long time. Now, the Gideons became more significant to Pastor Vernon later as he served as a chaplain in the U.S. Army. Ten of his 14 years in the U.S. Army were served in basic training. Now, he would pack up to go in the field with the young men, and he would pack life. And in his animal pouches, he would put in and get in the He would cause them fit perfectly. Pastor Vernon had the honor and privilege of seeing at least 1,300 soldiers to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, when he would talk to him about it, and they accepted the decision. He had had to be comfortable in the He had to go to the back page, sign their name, and put the date. And he would sign his name on the page. And he would say, Keep this with you. So when the devil tempts you and tells you you're not saved, you can pull it out, turn the back page, and remind yourself you're saved. He also encouraged them. But the more they did that, eventually they began to a heart and they not do it. He's truly grateful, that's where it is, to get in his ministry. He's also very thankful for every believer who helps God to get in ministry and go me. He has seen firsthand how God uses the resources that you may be able to fill in his kingdom. Isaiah 55 and 11 states, God's word shall not return to the earth, but shall accomplish its mission. How can you do that? Well, the first thing we need from you is to pray. That, excuse me, that the Holy Spirit moves those people who receive the New Testament. To and also for the safety of the men and women who hands out those good testimonies. We're also looking for friends of the Gideons. A friend of the Gideon is simply a person who prayerfully or financially helps support the Gideon ministry because our little brochure sent to them. And what the Gideons do is they send you updates. The International Gideon Committee sends you updates what's going on with the Gideon ministry regularly. And they invite you to different banquets, pastor appreciation banquets, and so forth that we hold in our local camps. Also, you would be allowed to purchase New Testaments, just like this kid in the to hand out to people. The only difference between the New Testament you would purchase and the ones that he has purchased is there would be no Gideon in the longer. Other than that, the exact same New Testament. So that would be the opportunity to do that. We also are looking for men who want to be partakers in distributing the work. We're looking for a few good men who can help out with if you're interested in seeing me and pastor afterwards. And we also ask them financial help. At the end of the service day, I'll be in the back door, checking up the offering to make this out of gift. All the money you give to the Gideons goes to purchase and deliver New Testaments in people's hands. A dollar twenty-five to take one of these New Testaments and actually place it into a person's hands. So $125 for a 
will be tested they are done in people's hands. Again, in Bible, we put hotels, cost about five dollars. They'll be there for six years and could reach up to 2,300 people. At this time, I have a little video here to show you about the Gideon car program. That's okay, Pastor. Okay. Yeah, what, I'm not sure why it's... It's not sure now. But what he was doing, back there in your foyer, we have Gideon cards that are set up for you. They're free of charge, or you can use them for memory, recognition of, thinking of you, praying for you, and be able to give, donate Bibles in your mind. And the cards are free for you to use. Thank you for your time.
who just asks that you would just bless us with your wisdom, knowledge, and discernment, and guide guiding and directing you, Lord. We have to go through this day, Lord, we just pray that you shine and beam for you for your kingdom for the rest of our lives. We pray for those that are not able to be here, Lord, that you will just bless them with abundantly overflowing with the desire to come back. We love you and we praise you. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, Psalms 23, we're going to go together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes his way around me in green pastures. He leads me beside the water waters. He preserves my soul. He guides me in all the other paths so he will be in his way. Even though I walk through the darkest hour, I will be in your name. For you are the
So that is great. That's wonderful. Anybody else have any prayer or praise reports? Well, Friday night we attended the ball game. We got soaked while we were eating, but well, thank God he put the rain away for the game. We got to see it. We won the extra innings. The Cubs won. And uh, I was pleased that they went directly to the fireworks instead of doing some of the other stuff that they do. Well, I'm pleased to report that we all got out of the fair. The cows did pretty good. The kids did excellent. They helped each other and no fighting or anything. I've never seen cows not behave in the ring like they did this year. They, I have never seen any cows running around the ring like they did this year, kicking up their heels. But they said it was all because of the weather, that they can tell when a storm's coming or their things are out. So. Anyway, it was very interesting. I'm thankful that nobody got really hurt. Um, there was a couple incidents, but my grandkids are pretty tough. The, the men also decided that there will be no more baseball games on the fairway. <laughs> That's a good decision. <laughs> it rains every time on fairway. Yeah. Well, we do praise the Lord for what He's been able to bless us with this week. He's abundant and overflowing. We welcome with blessings for us, and we do praise Him and thank you. Are there any other praises or prayer requests? Okay, Pastor, would you want to come forward and pray with us and for us, please? Let's pray.
not just in a book, but because we have proclaimed the good news that you have done in our lives, that we have become messengers of your kingdom. Messengers that says that, yea, no, we may walk through the valleys of darkness and shadows. Yet, Lord, you are with us. And because of that, we are more than conquerors. Because of that, we are reminded that we are not separated. And nothing can separate us from the love that comes through your Son, Jesus Christ, who brought us life. While we sat in condemnation, while we sat, sat separated from you, you have proclaimed that no more shall we be separated because of the grace and the love that comes through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, may we know that, and may we proclaim it. May we the, be the ones that are your witnesses around us to lift others up, to see them in their needs, to supply their needs, to invite them in to break bread, that you might be illuminated, that you might be known in their lives and in their hearts. And they too today might say, because I know the one whose name is Jesus, I know that there is a shepherd, and I know that I have found him. Lord, lift us from our sins. Be our strength in the midst of our weakness. Be our courage in the midst of our timidness. But Lord, come be with us today. Come be with our community. Go out into our community. Preparing their hearts to receive the goodness of your word. For our proclamation and our hope is this that surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. That we may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Not just in an eternity that rests in the future, but the eternity that has started now. Because you have proclaimed on this earth, before those whom you love, that you are the resurrection of life. Lord, give us life. Give us goodness. We cry in your holy and precious name, and in all things that God's people say. Amen. Amen. Let us give thanks through song as we sing the words of the doxology. As you're leaving, if you haven't already done so, you may leave your gift in one of the plates at the back of the room.
carried nothing with it. Uh, Mark tells us in the middle of what the apostles are doing and when they're on their way to return to Jesus to tell all they had done and taught. That in the middle of that story is the story of the beheading of John. The story of what power often does to uh, those that are carrying the message of Christ. Because it disrupts their lives. But it also tells us the story about the vulnerable. Those that were needing things, those that were wanting a shelter. And the impact that Jesus had on their lives and the apostles' message. Mark tells us that the apostles had gathered together with Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. And Jesus said to them, Come away by yourselves to a secure place and rest a while. For there were many people coming and going all the time and they did not even have time to eat. They went away in a boat to a secluded place by themselves. But the people saw them going and many recognized them and ran there together on foot from all of the cities and got there ahead of them. So when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then he began to teach them many things. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Genesaret, and moored to the shore. When they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him. That is Jesus. And they ran about that whole country and began to carry here and there on their pallets, those who were sick, to the place they heard he was. And wherever he entered villages or cities or countryside, they were laying the sick in the marketplaces and imploring him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak. And as many as touched it, they were cured. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading of his word this morning from the Gospel of Mark. Really a hopeful image for the church. The words that Mark gives us today. A hopeful image of people coming in droves, in large crowds, to see Jesus. To touch the garments that he was wearing. To receive some cure. To receive a healing. To receive his compassion and his mercy. Large crowds, Mark tells us, would run before Jesus. They would run and use as much energy as they could to get to him. And in the midst of that, they would carry their relatives and their friends, their townspeople, their community on pallets, on stretchers. All that they could get but a glimpse of Jesus. The church would do well to be reminded. To ask themselves from time to time, who is the Jesus that we invite others to? Who is the Jesus that we compel them to come and receive your healing, come and receive your blessing, come and receive what we would call eternal life? Come and be resurrected. Come and be lifted up. But so often times in life, we've given up on that message. So often in life, we've decided to do other things. Then remember that our message is to be apostles. Messengers, people that 
proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and the life and the resurrection that comes through. Not just that they might be saved one day, that they might go to some place, that they might live with Jesus in a future time. No, Mark reminds us that as people came to Jesus, he poured compassion out upon them. In the midst of this reading, what we don't get today is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Then in the process of Jesus, who is tired, and his apostles who had just returned from work and were exhausted, Jesus urges them and says, let's go to a place that's quiet. Let's find some rest. Let's eat. Let's get our refreshment. And in the midst of that, the crowds found. And they followed. Actually, Mark tells us that they went ahead of them and they beat them. And when they got there, Jesus and the apostles exhausted, hungry, thirsty, needing sustenance, needing revival in their own lives, trying to find a moment of prayer. Mark tells us that Jesus stopped and had compassion on them. And the food that maybe they had gathered for their, themselves, Jesus blessed, and he said distribute it to them, all 5,000 plus their, their families. Jesus isn't just worried about the needs that we have in eternity, the place we will go. Jesus says and reminds us that oftentimes it is the gift of compassion, the gift of looking in someone's life and asking, what is it that you need today? And saying, as inconvenient as it might be for me, Maybe it wouldn't be so bad if I had a cheeseburger meal <clears throat> and sit and create our own space and break bread together. You notice how often in the scriptures that it was when Jesus broke bread with others that they finally understood. Those two men on the road to Emmaus talking about what just happened. Not realizing that Jesus is with them. They sit down for a meal, Jesus breaks the bread, and it says they understood. They recognized it. There's something about food that helps us recognize it. There's something about the fellowship of breaking bread together. But so often we forget to invite people to the table. Or maybe that task is too hard for us. It's much easier to prepare a meal for my own family, to share a meal of refreshment with people I like, with people I know. Well, there are lots of people running today. And I suppose as a church, the question is, What's being served? Where are they running to? When they run ahead, what who or what are they encountering? And while we cry in our own lives, we need to get back to God. Our nation needs to get back to God. Our world needs to get, get back to God. What's interesting is we are the apostles. We are the messengers that draw people to Jesus himself just as the apostles were given the task that day, that moment, that time. Now Jesus doesn't say it's easy. Mark reminds us of how difficult it was. John was just beheaded for proclaiming news to Herod. It's, it's fraught with danger. The path is rocky. The path is difficult. 
And why is it difficult? Because not all of those who consume or hear will understand and perceive. But we are called to understand and we are called to proclaim. Even when it's inconvenient. Even when it's life-threatening. Even when we feel ill-equipped. But we must not give up on the mission that God has given to us. To proclaim the good news that Jesus stood on this earth and said, the resurrection begins now because I am the resurrection and the life. And to all who come to me, though they die in their bodies, yet shall they live. Because they will find life. They will find mercy. They will find compassion. The word for compassion or mercy in this scripture meant that Jesus was moved to do something to alleviate the burdens of their lives. And as more people heard that, they put people on pallets and they brought them to him just to get near him, that maybe they would be close enough to receive healing, to receive their legs back, to be able to hear things again, to be able to see clearly, to be able to be free from debilitating disease. And it's that same Jesus who sent his spirit and breathed his spirit on those who would receive it. All to send them out and say, you have the power. You have the spirit to do even more than I have. But we have to be willing to do something with like that God. But sometimes we cry out, we want God to be our shepherd. But we don't want to give up our own wants. Our other desires are big. He didn't come into this world to condemn the world. He came to give it life, and life abundant. But some of us are like the rich young ruler. And then we say, Jesus asked me for anything about that. I can't do it. So whether 5,000 people gather, whether three people gather, whether four people gather, what is it? This is this. If we do not proclaim the good news, how will they hear? And if they do not hear, how will they know? That is the only call of the body of Christ. To invite people to come. <clears throat> so the question this morning is, is when we invite them to come, and they come into the doors of the church, they come into the community, they come to the table. Are we bringing them to the feet of Jesus? Or are we bringing them to something? Are we bringing them to Jesus? Oh, help us. We want to be filled with the vision of a church that, like you, has compassion on those that are running ahead of us. We don't even see people. We 
don't see them because it's hard. We don't see them because it's easier to believe that they're out there and we're in here. It's so hard because it's too comforting for us to know that we have found the truth and they haven't. It's so hard because we think that they aren't deserving. It's hard because we have stopped looking at our communities. We've stopped looking at them as places that you are going. Speaking into their lonesomeness. Speaking into their solitude. We've stopped believing that you are working outside of these doors. And so we stop in life. Oh Lord, maybe it's us that need to be here. Maybe it's us who need to break bread with you again. Maybe it's we who need to be cured. <coughs> So draw near to us, Lord, that we might be close, that your power might come from just a touch or just a look, that we might be revived. That we might be in power. To say, come and eat. Let me tell you about the one who feeds me. The one who leads me beside quiet, peaceful waters. Let me do it by asking someone else what they need to do. And Lord, help us to supply them in this life. That they may live today. That we may walk together as we wait for the day that you return to come and take us to you. Lord, guide us as our shepherd. Challenge us and convict us to be your church. Be precious and holy in your name. And all God's people say. Amen. As we close out and prepare to break bread together today, let us stand and sing number 690.
in the mercy of his Son, being sent in the power of the Spirit till we gather again. Amen.